If you're a fan of Ghostbusters and haven't seen The Frighteners, well, stick around and hear my thoughts. I'm Peter Franson from ChristianGeekCentral.com and Spirit Blade Productions. This is my uncut review of The Frighteners, Director's Cut. The synopsis on IMDb reads, After a tragic car accident that kills his wife, a man discovers he can communicate with the dead to con people. However, when a demonic spirit appears, he may be the only one who can stop it from killing the living and the dead. So I'm having fun. My boys are on their fall break right now, and I'm taking time this week to uh, watch a number of movies that kind of fit with the Halloween season a bit, and this is the first one. I This has been in my collection for a long time, but I pull it out to introduce to my boys specifically and uh, watched it again myself for the first time in maybe five or as many as ten years. I'm not sure. It's been a good long while. Anyway, as far as the story, the script, the pacing, the tone, you know, this what is this basic animal? It's a blend of super supernatural horror and comedy, but leaning more into horror and suspense than even Ghostbusters uh, did, which itself had some suspenseful or, or even creepy or jump scare type moments. This movie even more has, a, has a, a, a larger number of jump scares and also more creepy and suspenseful scenes than Ghostbusters uh, did. Even so, the scares stay at a PG-13 intensity with the exception of one human head explosion that's played for comedic effect in the director's cut specifically. The humor largely comes from Frank Bannister, played by Michael J. Fox, interacting with ghosts that others can't see, with chuckles that are derived from how he's conning people with the help of these ghosts, or from the unusual personality traits of the ghosts themselves that he's regularly interacting with or working with. There are plenty of serious moments, too, I'd kind of forgotten about as Frank is recovering from the tragic loss of his wife, which yields some genuinely dramatic moments that Michael J. Fox isn't typically known for. Another key part of the plot is the mystery of who or what this grim reaper-like spirit is that is killing people around the town and even kind of quote-unquote killing ghosts as well. Uh, there are some nice turns and surprises in the story, and even knowing how it plays out, as I've seen this movie many times, I, I still found it satisfying coming back to it when those reveals happened, um, as I watched the protagonists kind of react to various revelations. Uh, let's see here, as far as the cast goes, we've got a 1996, well filmed in 95 I think, uh, but that era Michael J. Fox in a post Back to the Future and mid Spin City TV series point in his career, uh, and he's still playing that same wisecracking type of character that he's known for. Uh, this one, a little more kind of like careless and just like screw the world because he's in the midst of grief, but that plays out in this kind of reckless, I don't care what anybody thinks about me kind of attitude. Um, but as I said, you know, he also has these dramatic moments that while not, you know, especially powerful, I don't think of uh, Michael J. Fox as like this really dramatic actor, they were still nice moments uh, to see uh, as something very that I really don't expect to get from him. Most everyone else in the cast is a character actor of some kind, and while the punchlines now and then felt like they, like the, 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 the writer thought they were funnier than they really were and maybe kind of leaned on visual effects gags to kind of sell them, there were a lot of diversely quirky characters uh, performed by these actors that continued to keep me interested because of the way they were performed, the things that they did, uh, and at least I, you know, I was smiling uh, many times throughout the movie even if I wasn't laughing. The villains, when revealed, also stand out as strikingly psychotic in a slightly over-the-top kind of way that uh, that would find itself at home in an especially dark comic book story. So larger than real life, but still twisted, dark, and threatening. As far as the, the visuals go, this is the movie that, that Peter Jackson, who directed it, made his special effects company for, Weta Digital. Uh, Weta Digital existed at this time, but went from like one or two computers to, I don't know, like a couple dozen maybe? Um, in fact, to justify his investment uh, in computers in order to pull off the visual effects in this movie, he immediately began pursuing visually spectacular projects after this one. Before this one, he'd only done these really kind of low-budget uh, Australian, New Zealand type films with very practical effects like uh, 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 Dead Alive and, and, you know, really gross kind of uh, practical stuff, which of course he carried into uh, the, the Lord of the Rings as well, but uh, he really was wanting to cut loose with a lot of digital visual effects in a time when those kinds of effects were still in their infancy. Uh, and so after this, after buying all these computers, that led to him directing and pursuing projects like The Lord of the Rings, like King Kong. Uh, the visual effects in this movie were 
really ahead of their time. Uh, it, it's funny because it's it's you, you wouldn't expect a movie that is l significantly a comedy in addition to being like a, a, a suspense horror type setting. You wouldn't expect that kind of movie to have cutting edge visual effects, but that's absolutely what these were uh, at the time, and the movie is filled with them. Uh, they, they, they almost never seem to stop, and today they definitely look dated and far less convincing, but the design is still cool to look at. And since most of the effects are used to create supernatural creatures or supernatural effects, it's easy for me to suspend disbelief, since I don't expect ghosts and supernatural powers to look quote-unquote real. I just accept them as as looking weird and, you know, and, and, and as they are. Uh, the various visual gags are fun, sometimes freaky, and certainly plentiful throughout the experience. So even today, the visual effects of this movie are a big selling point of it and a big reason, I think, to, to check it out. Uh, I don't always comment on music, but it's worth noting, at least to me, that Danny Elfman did the score for this and it was still in his early stage when he was doing Beetlejuice, Edward Scissorhands, you know, had that kind of or, or Pee Wee's Big Adventure, lots of that, mm -ba, mm -ba, mm -ba, you know, that kind of weird, uh, chaotic yet whimsical kind of sound. All of that very much was coming to the forefront here, in addition to some genuinely uh, suspenseful cues that that are taken seriously. But this is like uh, at the, the high point, in my view, of like his creative style before he started going more mainstream with movies like. Planet of the Apes and things like that. So, uh, yeah, I, I really enjoy the score. I actually own the score. I've, had, I've owned it for years and, and uh, really enjoy uh, his work from that era. As far as themes, is there anything of moral, philosophical, or spiritual significance going on in the themes of this thing that might trigger some worthwhile thought or conversation? Well, as is almost always the case in movies in the supernatural horror genre, yeah, there's a ton of stuff that could be commented on, at least. Um, there's a... Um, how do I say this without spoiling? Okay, so heaven is an element. The ideas of heaven and hell are present, uh, not throughout. They're not regular things that are talked about. Mostly you have um, gags that are pulled from uh, common traits of near-death experiences. So like what you see people when they die, their spirit will come out of their body and then a shaft of light, a tunnel of light will appear that they will then go through to pass into the afterlife and, and we almost never see where they go. But there are a few instances where we do see what happens to characters and it's clear from this movie that that there is a form of hell that exists and a form of heaven that exists. And what's interesting about the, the, the idea of heaven is it's, it's treated much in the way that people talk about heaven in a very casual and kind of comical view. Like if someone was a big fan of golfing, then, you know, people will, will say, well, they're, you know, they're getting holes in one all the time now. You know, they're like, like they're off playing golf in heaven, you know. So in, in this version of heaven, there's... Uh, people that are like, you know, chick magnets. So, I mean, like, there's there's still, like, that kind of relationship between people, sexual relationships between people. People are smoking cigars, apparently, who really loved cigars, you know. Um, and, and I think that's weird, because I'm like, really? So this this person being a chick magnet when they're in heaven is seen as a good thing? And I'm like, I don't know. Do, is that really what you want, is a bunch of different women to just be drawn to you? Like, that's the ideal? I mean, these are things that we say and we joke about, but when we analyze them, it creates this view of heaven that is is really um, illogical and is ultimately uh, horrible <laughs> to think about. That, that, that there would be uh, the same kind of promiscuity that a person would be capable of as a chick magnet, and they could destroy people's emotions and lives, you know, for just using them for their bodies and stuff. I mean, the movie is not expecting us to think in those terms, and, and I'm not, like, getting in a huff and, like, oh, naughty, naughty movie for stuff like that, but I think that just using that stereotypical comical uh, representation of heaven it can just be a reminder for us to like really think about these things that we say or that we hear that are said thoughtlessly or that we hear and not, don't really think about them. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity to really think about what do I think happens after death and what are the reasons I think what are the reasons I, I have for thinking that that's actually likely to be true? And, and, and what, uh, what about it makes sense? Or maybe doesn't make sense and is worth challenging, you know? Um, we also have a funeral scene where uh, a person died that was not well liked, uh, but the guy, the, the, the priest or whatever doing the service, say, you know, is, is saying, well, you know, he wasn't known as a generous man, but... Uh, I'm sure that deep down he had a heart of gold and the ghost of that person that they're eulogizing is there and says, oh, 
<laughs> he's right. He, he wouldn't lie, not at a time like this. And I think the joke there is that uh, we're, as audience members, we understand, well, of course he's lying. That happens all the time at funerals. It's a very common thing for people to talk uh, up the deceased um, and and represent them in a much more positive light than is actually fair and reasonable. Now, is th there is some value, I think, in the mourning process to focusing on those things about a person that we loved and that we enjoyed and that we appreciated. Um, but I think, you know, those elements uh, we should just thank God for. Instead of, like, uh, thinking to ourselves they were only that and only focusing on that um, as if we need to somehow when they die, ignore all the things that were sinful about them, you know. Uh, that's that's kind of a weird thing that, that tends to happen, and I'm not sure why that is. Maybe it's we, we want to believe they're in a better place, and so we just focus on the good things about them, because that will quote-unquote earn them the better place that we want to envision them being at, or, or what. But I think that that phenomenon, in the way we talk about the deceased, the way we mourn the deceased, even as we're dealing with the hard elements of grief, um, I think at some point is worth evaluating and maybe even challenging. Um, let's see here. There's a, a shtick where we have to get ashes into a chapel in order to get rid of an evil spirit or something like that. And that's the closest they come to really bringing God or Jesus. It is specifically a Christian chapel of some kind, but that's the closest we get to validating um, Christian belief of any kind. And it's really only in this very super Official, superstitious kind of way, uh, and so that that's very common. Uh, I think they just do that to appeal to wider audiences, you know. Uh, but I think it's still interesting that so many depictions of heaven uh, are lacking the thing that actually makes them heaven, the one that actually makes them heaven, and that is God Himself actually makes heaven what it is. Otherwise, wh why do we have any reason to think that we're going to just continue living eternally and not be transformed and worth? living around uh, on the part of other people? Or why would we want to spend time and just extend this life with all the dysfunctions and hurt in relationships and the different things that we, that we experience, you know? Without God in the equation, we start to create this vision of heaven that is just not logically sustainable. Um, and so anyway, I think it's noteworthy when we see depictions of heaven and God is, is out of the equation. Uh, there is a reference to authorities in heaven. The, we have it, uh, we, you know, we, we've heard from the authorities that it's just not your time or blah, 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 whatever the sentence was. Um, and uh, I'm just like, okay, so there's a plurality of authorities. What does that mean? Is there some kind of like a, a structure of angels that they were talking to before God? Or is, is are they are we talking about polytheism here or what? You know, so they're keeping it very vague. Um, as I kind of mentioned before, the uh, the movie pulls a lot of ideas from the common traits found in near-death experiencers' uh, reports. Um, and I, I think that it was probably just a, a five to ten years before this movie came out, maybe more like ten uh, or fifteen, that, uh, um, that I believe his name is Raymond Moody, his book about near-death experiences came out that really started to bring a lot of interest to the phenomenon. And of course, there's a lot better books, and a lot, uh, I think, more responsibly collected data since then about near-death experiences. But this would have been when, when the, the, the elements of near-death experiences, like the tunnel of light, started becoming more common knowledge. And so they were pulling a lot of those kinds of things into their depiction of the moments right after death in this movie. So I think there's springboard for potential thought or conversation there. Uh, there's the idea, and I've seen this in other movies too, but there's the idea of evil spirits being able to escape from hell, uh, which again takes God out of the equation. Um, if hell is a place for punishment and quarantining of evil, uh, and God is the one that is ultimately um, uh, uh, ensuring that that quarantine remains in place, then there ought not be anyone or anything that is able to escape from hell. But if God's out of the picture, then, you know, okay, what are the rules? We just make up the rules or whatever, you know. So, uh, interesting kind of like an element there. There's also a lot of agency given to the individual person who dies. Uh, there's, uh, and this is another, I think, bit of evidence of God being out of the picture. When a person dies, they are able really to choose whether or not they are going to stay on earth and continue haunting it after death, um, or 
go to whatever their destination is permanently in the afterlife, you know. Um, and uh, that's not really an idea that's, that, that comes from Christian teaching at, at all. And I think it gives uh, agency and power to humans that um, we wouldn't want to adopt, that we ought to have a more humble perspective about uh, what power we really do and do not have once we are done in this life. And even, you know, while we're living in this life, for that matter. Uh, what an interesting uh, an interesting bit here that, that I don't think was intentional, I don't think is a, a comment that they're making, but the tunnel of light that people go through in this movie doesn't necessarily always lead to heaven. And I think that uh, something that a lot of people choose to take from near-death experiences is if you see the tunnel of light, that means you're destined for a good place, a better place. But there are at least... Uh, two or three people in this movie that go through the tunnel of light and it, they're not they're not going to heaven you just don't you don't get that sense uh, from from well yeah it's very clear in the case of two of them and subtly clear if you watch the movie more than once in the case of another character so uh, I think that's I think in talking about near-death experiences um, there's a point worth making that these are near-death experiences that we ought not take from these experiences uh, assumptions about what eternity will be like. The most that these experiences can give us is information about what it might be like in the first few moments or a very limited period of time after someone quote-unquote dies. But they can't really give us information about what the eternal state of a person is. For that, we need to go and seek that data elsewhere. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, Kind of like, uh, in summary, I don't think that the, the, the ideas that this movie is putting out there are, are going to convince anyone. They're certainly not, I don't think, intended to convince anyone. It's, it's so much of it is comedic and over the top and stuff. But I think that it does uh, unwittingly help suggest perpetuate and give oxygen to a lot of false ideas that are worth not just letting go without questioning and challenging, you know. Um, Let's see, is there any value for Christian geeks in particular? I think mostly as a possible springboard for a thought or conversation, you know, about death, about near-death experiences. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I think that there's, there's, there's springboards there if you want to use them, but certainly it can easily be enjoyed as a movie that you just treat as, as fantasy and enjoy it on that level. All right, I have no idea what your tastes are in movies, but if I were a time traveler, I'd go back in time and say... Peter, and I'd have to go back pretty far. I'd have to go back to like pre-1996 because I'm pretty sure I did see this in theaters. Uh, so I'd talk to a very young Peter, a pre-graduating from high school Peter, and I would say, dude, watch this. Uh, it's going to be worth coming back to many, many times over the course of your life until you get to your mid-40s. Uh, your boys, believe it or not, you are going to have two kids. Somehow that's going to happen. Uh, your boys... 11 and 14 are going to enjoy the director's cut, even with an exploding head. Um, any time you find a fan of Ghostbusters who hasn't seen this one, you're going to be recommending it to them. It's like the first thing that you would say they should go and see. You're going to continue to do that for many years. Uh, this is going to be one that you will gladly have in your collection and show to many people uh, for a long, long time. And those are all my thoughts for now on The Frighteners. Uh, I would love to get your thoughts and reactions in the comments below. Please like, share, subscribe, click that bell to uh, stay connected to what's going on here. I want to thank the Spirit Blade in Insiders for making so much of what I do possible. You can get info about the benefits of becoming an insider at patreon.com slash spiritbladeproductions. And then I hope you'll check out our podcast and stay connected to all CGC content at christiangeekcentral.com as we continue to geek out and seek the truth. Once again this year, I'm raising funds for children in urgent need, this time fundraising for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, which provides free treatment for children facing life or death circumstances, and shares its cutting-edge, life-saving research with hospitals all over the world. To raise funds, I'm leading members of the Christian Geek Central community in our Game Save 21 event, which you're still welcome to join by following the link in the description below. And once again this year, I'm drawing attention to our team's fundraising by performing a 24-hour marathon of video gaming that I will stream live on youtube.com slash christiangeekcentral beginning 6 a.m. Pacific time on Saturday, November 6th. You can donate or get more info by clicking on my fundraising page in the links below where you'll also find incentives and rewards for doing so. For donating $5 or more, you can choose a topic for me to share my sometimes overly strong opinions on during my live stream. For $10 or more, you get the previous reward and a download code for a free copy of the Spirit Blade Special Edition audio drama. 
For $20 or more, you get the previous rewards, and you can choose a game for me to play during my November 6th live stream. Pick a favorite or torture me with something terrible or rage-inducingly difficult. At $30, you get the previous rewards, and you can choose a song for me to sing during my November 6th live stream. Pick an old favorite of yours, or just make me humiliate and torture myself with something no one wants to hear. And at $50 or more, you get the previous rewards and a download code for every MP3 product at spiritblade.com. That's an $80 value. On top of that, I've set some fundraising milestones that will unlock strange and unusual happenings as I reach them. At $200, I'll have a free download day for everyone who visits spiritblade.com on November 13th. And as my total goes beyond $200, I'll unlock increasingly more content for that free download day. And depending how far beyond $200 my fundraising goes, during my November 6th live stream, I will show a photo of me you will never be able to unsee, put on a pair of frozen socks and a frozen t-shirt at the same time, shoot water up my nose with a turkey baster, and have my wife Holly play a video game with me for 30 minutes. And if I reach a personal fundraising total of $500 or more, I will do a two-hour jump scare live stream before the end of the year featuring only the games that terrify me most, including Dead Space and PT. Now, I don't want to do that, but I know you sick people want to see that, so you're going to have to pay money to make it happen. And if I reach my $500 goal by the end of Thursday, October 21st, I will do a four-hour live stream on Monday night, October 25th, doing my pathetically absolute best to get good at a game in the Souls genre. Now, there are some stipulations and time limits on those rewards and milestones, so quickly follow the link below to my fundraising page for all the details. I hope that you will be a part of helping me and the Christian Geek Central Game Save team do some good for some kids and families who really need it. And then please join me at youtube.com slash Christian Geek Central for my 24-hour video gaming marathon starting at 6 a.m. Pacific time on Saturday, November 6th. Hope to see you then. <sighs> <laughs> oh my gosh, this is all kinds of wrong.